speaker. Final speaker? Yeah. <laughs> is a beloved associate professor of the Kaplan School of Business. He specializes in business law, negotiation, and workplace and the happiness, happiness in the workplace. Uh, he was a former actor, published author, and uh, he's done speaking engagements for the UN. Please welcome Professor James Lynch. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you very much. If I'm not ready, but that's okay. We'll do it anyway it goes. Uh, that's all right. Um, one of the things I, I'm so glad to be here, uh, a lot of you are my students, so it's kind of weird. I feel like I have a class that's going on and I'm not prepared for it. I actually, um, should I have to stand here? Uh, move however you want. Okay. If you want to set up the yeah, I want to just go over for a second. Yeah, feel free. What I'm going to do is I had actually um, <clears throat> took me a while to figure out what I was going to talk about because no one had asked me specifically what I was going to talk about, and so many things are going on right now that um, uh, I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't quite sure. If, for example, did we want to talk about environmental deg degradation that's going on? You know, I gave a talk just recently at Union Theological uh, about a week ago. Or um, about whether or not we can survive the planet's uh, changes. Are we all aware of that? So I'm just putting that out there because that's part of what my theme is. I wanted to talk about something that I'm um, actively involved in called the new culture of peace. The reason why I think that's so important is that it doesn't mean I'm not talking about just war. I'm talking about how we engage ourselves as human beings in the marketplace of humanity. Does that make sense to everybody? You know, we're, we're actually, don't mind me, you're going to see my password, so don't, make, you know, don't, don't copy it down or anything like that. <laughs> um, we need to figure out how we're going to go forward as human beings. You know, even, even thinking with the climate situation, even Donald Trump has suggested now, if we think about it, even Donald Trump has suggested now that climate change is real. And I'm not saying that is against Donald Trump, I'm saying that's the reality. So even people who were climate deniers are now saying the planet is in crisis. Does that make sense? But, so what? What are we going to do about it? Saving. Save I like that kind of talk. <laughs> save it. You know, but the question becomes, how are we going to save it? And I'm going to just push this in because the question becomes, we always think, I'm going to jump around because that's how I... Right? <clears throat> and I set up a special little thing for you guys. I have a thousand I get never. Let's do that never so nobody can go and make prank phone calls and stuff like that. <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is, when we think of things like climate change, you can see I, this is ABC presentation. I specifically did this for you guys. And I want to just start off with this one. I'm actually going to, it's about a three minute little clip. Is that okay? I wanted to set the tone for everybody. I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. And so, and I don't care if you see what it is, but it's here, there's an anonymous JFK speech. Some of you saw it because some of you are in my class. But I wanted to make sure you put this in your mind. Think about where we are. What year is this? That's 18, right? As long as you make sure okay, everybody's okay. <laughs> Dangerous one sitting in the front. Um, <laughs> right, so I want to make sure that we all understand, could the president, is this what we'd be saying today to each other? I want you to think about this. Listen to it. It's a very short one. Therefore, chosen this time and place to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds and the truth too rarely perceived, and that is the most important topic on earth peace. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. We need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. And man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit 
have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. World peace, like community peace, does not require that each man love his neighbor. It requires only that they live together in mutual tolerance, submitting their disputes to a just and peaceful settlement. Peace need not be impractical, and war need not be inevitable. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it. Genuine peace must be the product of many nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. For peace is a process, a way of solving problems. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We do not now expect a war. This generation of Americans has already had enough, more than enough, of war and hate and oppression. We shall be prepared if others wish it. We shall be alert to try to stop it. But we shall also do our part to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We are not helpless before that task or hopeless of its success. Confident and unafraid, we must labor on, not towards a strategy of annihilation, but towards a strategy of peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. Make sense? So here we are, Brooklyn College. Peace for all time. My question to you is, how do we do that? How do we do that? Those were nice sounding words, and in fact, I don't know if we could get a president to talk like that today. <laughs> right? Sounds, sounds different, right? So I have spent a lot of my time, some of you don't know this, but I'm also the president of the Buddhist Council here of New York. I'm a Buddhist. Don't hold it against me. I'm a Buddhist, and we represent about 70 or 80 monastic traditions here in New York. And so the issue becomes, for me, as a person of African American, how did we get to this place? How do we come together so we can love each other and be compassionate towards each other? Right. So the issue becomes, peace now. What do we do? One of the first things I think that I learned in my practice, um, and also from another part of my tradition, I come from two generations of ministers on both sides of my family, Christian ministers. Are we listening to each other? Do you think you listen? Or do we pretend to listen? In an era of twixing and, <laughs> and instantaneous Instagram, are we really listening to each other? So I wanted to do, say, take a few minutes just to practice something we do in my class. Some of you have been in my class. I didn't even know who was going to be here. Can we do this exercise together just to get you guys talking amongst yourself? Because it's great that I'm up here, but it's more important that we have community. Does that make sense? People look at what is he going to have us do? Like get up here and dance like a chicken? No, I'm not going to have you do anything like that. But would it be good? Can I have one? Who's, who's, who's willing to come up here and be the vo victim, I mean the volunteer, <laughs> to come up with anybody? You, thank you very much. Come on up. Thank you. Everybody. Big round of applause. So I want you to go like this. No, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, right? We're going to do this. I'm, I'm, what's your name? Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Great to meet you. Hi. All right, my name's Jane. Wow. Let's do it again. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? That's, I like that. Good firm handshake. All right, Michelle. So here you are. Are you a Brooklyn College student? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Michelle, what year are you? Uh, I'm a junior. You're a junior. You're almost out of here. The suffering's almost over. All right. And today's what? Today is uh, Tuesday, right? So you were alive on the weekend, right? You were alive. So, so please tell me about your weekend. 
I'm, gonna, I'm just going to listen to her. Is that okay? I want to just listen to what Michelle has to tell us about her great weekend. I'm sure you had a great weekend, right? Did you have a great weekend? Yeah, oh, so please tell me about it. All right, so uh, this weekend I went on a hiking trip with my fellow SLC members uh, up in the Catskills, which was awesome. The fresh air was amazing. The mountains were amazing. I loved the woods. That was, it was, a, it was a great day. So then on Sunday I worked uh, most of the day. Some homework in the morning, but mostly, mostly worked. And then I, uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. I went hiking this weekend, and I worked on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening, Michelle. Go on, go on, go on. I'm paying attention. Go on. I'm paying attention. <laughs> How do you feel? Uh, I feel ignored. You feel ignored. Mm -hmm. Ignored. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Come up here A lot of you. I'm sorry, Michelle. No, that was the exercise. <laughs> Exactly. The exercise was for us to realize that sometimes when we don't pay attention to other human beings, whether individually or communally, we lose our kinship and we feel ignored. Our safe space is lost. So a lot of people like to talk about safe space. Well, the safe space should be wherever Michelle is. Because Michelle is important. I want you to know that. This was just part of the exercise, okay? So can we practice with each other? Just partner the person next to you and just take one, 40 seconds, because we don't have a lot of time. It's not like my normal class. Can we just take 40 seconds going back and forth and ignoring each other as someone tells you something about your weekend? All right, everybody. We're back in town. We're back here. We're back in room 320. People are having too much fun. That means you didn't ignore her properly, all right? You didn't ignore her properly. How do people feel being ignored? You felt ignored? Disappointed. Disappointed. What else? Anybody else? What else did they Sad, say? Hurt. Sad? Hurt? Angry. Angry. <laughs> that's important. Hey, that's very important. You know, have you ever gone to a job interview and the person ignores you because of maybe uh, you're bald or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I've been ignored in job interviews. It makes you angry. So one of the key things that we need to create peace, right, and I say a new culture of peace, is to listen to each other. Even in the small ways, because the question I have, I know people are saying, what the heck, I want them to use strong language because I'm being taped, right? <laughs> what the heck is going to happen if I just do my little part, right? Well, I'm gonna tell you something by the end of the day, you're gonna be able to change the world. Did you hear what I said? You're gonna be able to change the world. Isn't that exciting? Very exciting. Right here, right now. I had to figure out something that you hadn't seen in my class before. Mm. So some of you in my class. So we're going to change the world. So let's figure out one more. I'm going to use Michelle one more time. We're going to do one more exercise, another two-minute exercise. This is another one that people do. They think they're listening. We think we're listening. We think we're engaged. And guess what? We're not. Michelle, go on. we're going to do the same sort of thing. You're going to tell me about your weekend. I heard you, so you want, just want you to know. You went hiking. You did a lot of great stuff with a lot of great people, some of them in this room, right? And I want you to tell me. She's like, what's going to happen now? Don't worry, it's typical what people do. So go ahead and tell me about your weekend. Okay. So Saturday, I went hiking. Saturday, you know what I did on Saturday? I was with <laughs> Karina Gore. <laughs> Karina Gore is uh, Al Gore's daughter, and she had a program in which I spoke at Union Theological, in which I talked about the implications of religion, various religions, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Native American traditions, and how we can save the planet together. It was unbelievable, Michelle. Unbelievable. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What are you saying? I'm sorry. I get so excited about this. You bring it out of me. You bring it out of me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so, yeah. So, I went hiking. Hiking. Went you know, the last time I went hiking, last time I went hiking, I was in, I, what was I? I was in New Hampshire. In Canaan, New Hampshire, I almost died. I fell, almost fell this, I was like this, and I stopped. I was scared. I was about 15, so I got, I have a fear of heights. Do you have a fear of heights? No, I love heights. You have, well, I, I don't. I can't do that. Like, I don't even like going to circusing, the trampoline people, and stuff like that. It makes me nervous, squeezy. Even elevators make me a little nervous. How do you, how do you feel about elevators? Elevators, no, I like Do you see what I did? Yeah. What did I do to this conversation? <laughs> Well, it's called hijacking. Yeah. It's a conversational hijack that we want to avoid. Because we want to make sure that Michelle, when I look at Michelle, Michelle is a sacred person. And her story is sacred. Nobody's like Michelle on the planet. Her sorrows, her joys, are her own. And the only way I can know about Michelle is to do what? Is to listen to Michelle. That make sense to everybody? So let's sit, thank, let's everybody give Michelle a big round of applause. Give me that front hand, thank you, Michelle. Thank you.
and everybody practice for 30 seconds hijacking. Some of you might do this naturally. Some of you might naturally hijack. So, so try to hold back and switch back and forth and hijack and see how you feel. Because the first one we felt lonely, angry, and, uh, 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 right? Some of those things. All right, so do the next one. Go ahead. Thank you so much. All right, can we come back now? Are we okay? Okay. Let me ask anybody, what were the feelings? You see guys are smiling too much. That means if you're smiling, that means you're a natural hijacker. <laughs> That's what that means. You hijack on a regular basis. And here's the key point. If we're hijacking on a regular basis, how are we making the other person feel? Badly. Because one of the key things that we need to remember is this. We transmit our feelings like a contagion. When we're happy, we hug each other. When you're with your friends and you're having sorrow, you bring empathy. They call it rapport, right? We build rapport with people instantaneously if we're in harmony with them. Does that make sense to everybody? So one of the things I wanted to say here is that in our interactions, we must begin to see our past, I wrote it down, as sacred again. And here's the question I asked you. Do you see yourself as sacred? And if you don't, why not? Who's convinced you of that? Who has told you that you should only have marketplace coinage as your value? Do you understand what I mean by that? You're only worth how much money you have in your bank account. So I step back again and say, who says you're not sacred? Yeah, I get to talk like that in this particular talk. I don't get to talk like that in my class. Sometimes I get little drops. But my question to you is, I want you to see our lives as sacred again. Our lives imbued with dignity, I wrote down. And one of the things I wanted, this is an analogy I often use, when you meet people, rather than hijack them, I want you to think of something. You're going to leave people, have, have you ever had an aunt or an uncle who had too much perfume on? I've used this analogy before, so you know that. You have someone like hug you and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm just not like you for the rest of the week, right? But do you realize that your life is like a perfume? You're like a beautiful flower. And when you meet someone, you leave them with a smell. A residue of your beingness. What kind of residue or what kind of scent are you leaving people with? Are you leaving them with hope? Joy, compassion, caring, or are you hijacking their life and their story? Interesting, right? All right. So we need to be mindful of our perfume. And so one of the things I was going to say is, I had here down here something called a social impact video, which I'm going to show in 10 seconds. Do you think that you are impactful? I'm just jumping around because I know we only have a little bit of time to get you where you guys got to go. The question is this. Do you think that you can be impactful in your lives? How much impact do you think you really have? Do you think you have a little bit or a lot? A lot. You think you have a lot? Great. Because most people don't think they can make a change. And that's why they don't take their lives seriously. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you try? Then why don't you do that? If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you try? Because sometimes we feel it won't make a difference. But I want to show you something, and here's the thing, I don't know if it's the same in my classes. Causes plus conditions equals outcomes. You're always producing outcomes in your life. You're always producing effects in your life. Do you realize that? That's why you're sitting in these chairs. You took certain actions, and the conditions were right, and that's why you're sitting here in Brooklyn College, most of you are juniors and seniors. You put together this wonderful program, and if you continue to do this, you'll change people's destiny. So I'm going to show you something funny about causes and conditions, something stupid, because right? sometimes we can see our own brilliance in stupidity. Right? I'm going to show you this video quickly, and you're going to see how one person can be influenced and how they can influence others. Has anyone seen this before? Yes. All right, raise your hand. All right, give me some money. See, I keep making him raise his hand. <laughs> I'm having fun with him. Sorry, I can't help myself. I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. All right, All right so here we go. Watch this video. Go back here, and let's just watch what we see. ...in this room is working for us. I'll be with you in just a couple minutes. Today we're running an experiment on social conformity, and the test starts now. Did you hear that? These people sure did. It 
doesn't take long for our test subject to notice a pattern. Beep means stand up. But why? And if you were in her shoes, what would you do the next time the tone sounds? While you might think you make your decisions all on your own, when it comes to peer pressure, all too often, your brain is just following the crowd. It's all around you, every day. An invisible force you're probably not even aware of. It affects what you do, how you think, and who you are. It's called social conformity, or peer pressure. And while it might not sound like a good thing, it's actually not so bad. The truth is, your brain craves synchronicity and takes comfort in the ease and efficiency of just going with the flow. And whether it's simply knowing what to wear in the morning, supporting your team at the big game, or even marching off to war, we're all programmed to be part of the group. And that's because your brain knows that there's power in numbers. We set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? Watch her. Watch her. After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat, and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Thanks so much. He does not know what's going on. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? That's what? That's what? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. I want to know and something. Slowly but Does sure. it matter race or gender? What began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Here to explain what's going on. That's all I wanted to do. Did you see that? We can give them a round of applause, can't we? Because they were, they were a little humor. But what did it show you? What did it show you? If you go first. If you're compassionate first, if you're caring first, people will what? Follow you. Follow you. If you're truly compassionate, you can change the world. If you really care, you can change the world. We start listening, we start caring, we start loving, and we create a new culture of peace. Thank you very much.